Hey, how's it going, everyone? Um, so my name is Eric Singh. I'm one of the I'm the uh, educator coordinator for the Brain Bee for 2020 2021. Um, and this, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the body and balance, homeostasis. This uh, correlates to Chapter 10 of the Brain Facts book, um, and this is going to be a significantly a significant portion of your exam. So um, I hope I can explain this in a way that makes sense for you guys, and I can add some little tidbits of, of information in that context to these slides. So that's what we'll be testing on for the exam. So homeostasis in a, in a nutshell is the ability to maintain a normal physiological state. However, this does not mean that it's a static process. It's a dynamic process. So what is static? Well, static means it stays the same, whereas dynamic is the opposite, whereas it is constantly changing. So, but you may think, well, if it has to maintain a normal physiological function constantly, it will be the same. However, that isn't true. Um, it has to be dynamic because if we consider the, the variability of our days, one day it could be a weekend and we play five hours of basketball or football or some other sport. And on a weekday, we spend five hours sitting in a chair studying. And our body has significantly different needs on those two different days. So because it is able to maintain, um, it, it, because homeo, this homeostatic functioning is dynamic, it has a capacity to um, to go back to a certain baseline despite these differences in activities. And the reason why it's able to, even though it's constantly changing and moving, the reason it's able to stay within a normal physiological uh, range or baseline is because it has regulatory loops via negative feedback, as I'll talk about later on in this uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So moving on to the next slide, um, we gotta consider, okay, that's cool. We know what homeostasis is. It's a, maintain, it's a maintenance of normal physiological functions, but what does that have to do with the brain? We're, we're, this is the brain bee. How does the brain come into play with homeostasis? And that's interesting because the brain and more specifically the hypothalamus has everything to do with homeostasis. The reason being is because the hypothalamus is the master control of the body. And ultimately that's what controls homeostasis. And we're gonna go more in depth on uh, the internal clock, sleep cycles, and as well as hormone secretions, which affects the entire body. But as you guys can see from this picture, let me pull up a uh, laser pointer. All right, we have the brain here. Right up here above this dangling thing, we have the hypothalamus, and this will secrete signals down to the pituitary, which will then re release hormones to the rest of the body via the anterior pituitary lobe and the posterior pituitary lobe. And they're connected by this stock, which contains the uh, median eminence, as we'll talk about later. But this is basically uh, the way that the brain can very quickly cause changes in the entire body rapidly. So one of the main misconceptions that we have to eliminate about the, our internal clock is that all cells have internal clock, not just, not just our brain. Um, and this is important because the internal clock is regulated differently in each type of cell. So um, there is, it was shown in a few experiments that jet lag is because the uh, internal clock in our brain and in some other, or the, other organs adjusts more quickly than the internal clock in our liver cells. So this, so this disconnect between different parts of our body's internal clocks is what causes the sluggishness in jet lag. So, but what is internal clock? Why is it important? Well, it's important because this regulates almost all bodily functions, including our digestion and blood pressure regulation. For example, during the day, we have significantly increased peristaltic movement of our GI tract during the day, and we have decreased blood pressure, uh, a, a decreased average blood pressure when we're sleeping at night, as well as decreased body temperatures and whatnot. And the reason why this, this is important, and we're talking about uh, and this is uh, regulated by the hypothalamus is because this is reliance on vision, right? So based, based on if we see daylight or night, um, this will affect our internal clock and affect our suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, based on connections, uh, in, indirect connections with our optic nerve. So I just mentioned the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which controls the internal clock, the circadian rhythm. But what is it? Well, just like with all nuclei, it is a small group of neurons within the hypothalamus. But 
the function of the small group of neurons in the hypothalamus is that it propagates a constant stream of action potentials throughout the day, but is quieter in the night. So what happens is um, the when we see daylight through our optic nerve, our, our brain is able to interpret this as, oh, it's daytime. And so it triggers the suprachiasmatic nucleus to release a constant stream of action potentials as long as we see bright lights. However, when the light dims, the nerve starts to slow down and become more quiet during the night, which signals that it's time for sleep. And you might be wondering, well, how is it possible that it's able to translate these signals into ash potential streams? Well, it's actually by a cyclical interactions of two groups of proteins within the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, so these will go back and forth, alternating on or off, depending on the day or night. And um, what's important here is that the cycle of protein interaction is actually slightly longer than 24 hours. So what happens is um, in experiments in a lab uh, with mice, when they are um, when they don't have any uh, visual stimulation to tell them it's day or night, they gradually sleep and wake up later and later in the day. Um, but once they start, uh, but once they're allowed to be see the sunlight or whatnot, and their photoreceptors allows it to sync up with the actual day and night cycle, which is a pretty cool uh, tidbit of facts. But so that's cool. Um, how? But how is it that the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that tiny little clump of cells in our hypothalamus, how does that affect the rest of our body? Well, that's because it directs, uh, it connects directly to the paraventricular nucleus. And this paraventricular nucleus is a in integral part of the neuroendocrine system because it has so many connections uh, based on this picture shown below. So as we can see that this paraventricular nucleus, it has connections to the brainstem or to the sympathetic nervous system, right? And it's important um, that the sympathetic nervous system has a chain of ganglia, which through uh, only activation of one part of the sympathetic system from the PVN, it can actually cause changes in the entire body very rapidly because of this chain of ganglia. It also has connections to the locus ceruleus, which is a serotonergic center, which can have uh, various effects on the brain and the spinal cord. And finally, it can have effects on the pituitary gland, which can, uh, which can release certain hormones we'll talk about later, such as ACH, go to the, uh, and then release um, ACTH from the pituitary, going to the adrenal glands, releasing stress hormones and cortico, uh, glucocorticoids and whatnot uh, to go back and affect the brain and the paraventricular nucleus as a result. Um, another thing that's pretty interesting is that um, I found in my research that the paraventricular nucleus can actually stimulate orexinergic neurons. So orexiner so orexinergic neurons secrete something called orexin. And orexin uh, is ma mainly used in two things. Um, one is hunger. So when you're hungry, you'll increase the amount of orexin in your system. And as a result, um, and this is the reason why when we, when we are hungry, we're less sleepy because orexin also decreases our drowsiness and tiredness. So uh, very interesting as well. So when we have uh, increased stress or when it's daytime, orex, uh, orexin is increased and which will make us less tired, but also a little bit more hungry, like in the mornings. So just a little bit more about sleep. Um, other than orexin, as I just mentioned, melatonin also helps regulate sleep. The hormone you guys are, I'm sure you guys all know about. So referring to the previous model in the previous slide, or also just, you could use this model as well, this picture, we can see that um, a pathway to go from, uh, to go from it being dark to secrete melatonin and go to sleep. Well, uh, our optic nerve can detect that it's nighttime which will then signal the suprachiasmatic nucleus to stop its constant stream of action potentials, which will stop simulating the paraventricular nucleus, which will then affect the pineal gland to secrete melatonin at night and help you sleep. And as we just mentioned, uh, melatonin binds to many cell types to reduce alertness and increase sleepiness throughout the body. Um, and as we just talked about, light exposure stops melatonin because then it will activate the suprachiasmatic nucleus which, act, which uh, will affect the paraventricular nucleus, which will inhibit the pineal gland secretion of melatonin. But this will allow it to keep it on a keep the body on a synchronized twenty four hour cycle. And another thing about sleep is that when we wake up, um, we wake up gradually uh, over the span of half an hour an hour, 
when the sun comes up because our cortisol levels slowly increase and our core body temperature slowly increases because of these hormone change. These hormone levels uh, will modulate based on when we see daylight. So to talk about, so now we have to talk about the neuroendocrine system, right? What is the connection between the brain and the rest of the body via the endocrine system? Why, so it's called the neuroendocrine system. Well, as we've already uh, preluded in the, in the previous and previously, um, it is all based and starts in the hypothalamus, which is very close ties to the pituitary. Um, now, there are two portions to the pituitary gland. There's a posterior and anterior pituitary. Um, a, another name for the posterior pituitary is the neurohypophysis. And another name for the anterior pituitary is the adenohypophysis. The reason why the posterior uh, pituitary is called the neurohypophysis, um, or actually not really the reason why it's called that, but a way that helps remember it, is that um, oxytocin and ADH are produced in the hypothalamus, right? So specifically the paraventricular nucleus produces oxytocin and the superoptic nuclei produces um, antidiuretic hormone, and they're just stored in the posterior pituitary for storage. However, in the anterior pituitary, um, it'll have, there's about seven, hor uh, seven hormones secreted from the hypothalamus, which will then go via the median eminence down the pituitary stalk to the anterior pituitary. However, the anterior, the anterior pituitary doesn't store these hormones. What it does is it will, it will detect these uh, hormones from the uh, hypothalamus, which will then cause it to create its own hormones to secrete out. And we'll talk about the specific hormones in the next slide. However, I just want you to point out the fact that one, as I just said, the posterior pituitary only stores hormones from the brain. So that's why I remember that it's called the neurohypothesis because it has a closer connection to the brain. However, the anterior pituitary um, doesn't store hormones from the brain. It creates its own hormones, which then be released into the bloodstream. So now we're going to be talking about this picture, right? This is um, a nice overview of anterior pituitary hormone release. So on the top slide, we have the hormones released from the hypothalamus. Then we have in the middle, this plus and minus signs tells you if it's upregulates or downregulates these downstream molecules, which is released from the anterior pituitary, right? And then down here, it goes, this is where, this is these specific tissues the hormones go to. Because remember, um, the neuroendocrine system starts in the tiny clump of cells in the hypothalamus, but then it can affect the whole body downstream. So talking about these hormones, we have uh, prolactin releasing hormone from the hypothalamic hypothalamus, which will increase the, the anterior pituitary's secretion of prolactin which will then, these, this prolactin hormone will then go to the breast to create milk in women. Additionally, uh, talking about prolactin as well, uh, prolactin inhibitory hormone, which is interestingly the same, which is just dopamine, will actually uh, downregulate anterior pituitary secretion of prolactin, which will mean that less breast milk is created. Another hormone created by the, secreted by the hypothalamus is thyrotropin releasing hormone, which will upregulate the, the anterior pituitary secretion of thyroid stimulating hormone, which will then go to the thyroid gland, which will then release thyroid hormones, such as T3 and T4, which is essential for growth and development. So the next uh, hypothalamic secreting hormone is corticotropin releasing hormone. This will upregulate this the anterior pituitary secretion of adenocorticotropin hormone which will go to the adrenal cortex and will upregulate the amount of cortisol released from there. Next, we have growth hormone releasing hormone and growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Growth hormone releasing hormone, as you guys can probably tell by the name of it, will upregulate um, the amount of growth hormone released from the anterior pituitary, whereas the uh, growth hormone inhibiting hormone will inhibit the amount of growth hormone released from the anterior pituitary. So as you guys can see from this chart, somatostatin is an inhibit has an inhibitory function for uh, for growth hormone. However, it is also secreted from the pancreas and the uh, stomach because of its inhibitory function as well. So somatostatin is a growth inhibiting inhibitor, 
and it, and it also has different functions throughout the body as well. But it'll go to, but growth hormone, when it is upregulated from the growth hormone releasing hormone, will go to the liver to uh, create uh, growth factors such as insulin and, always, and also go to other cells throughout the body with the appropriate androgenic receptors. And finally, the last hormone we'll be talking about secreted from the hypothalamus is gonadotropin releasing hormone which will upregulate the amount of LH or luteinizing hormone or FSH follicular stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary, which will go to the gonads and in males, uh, increase the, produc the production of androgens and in females, increase the production of estrogens and progesterone. So next we're gonna be talking about regulation, right? As I, as I preluded in uh, the beginning of the PowerPoint that despite homeostasis being a dynamic process, it's able to maintain a certain physiological function. And that is because of very tight regulation. Specifically, it's gonna be by negative feedback. So I'm gonna use um, a chart of the negative, re uh, negative regulation of um, stress to show this, to show negative feedback. So basically, uh, if the, the hypothalamus, as we talked about previously, will release CRH, which will trigger the pituitary to release ACTH, which will then trigger the adrenal cortex to release glucocorticoids like cortisol. However, um, as we'll talk about later, having too much cortisol in your system is actually very bad for you. It can decrease the amount of calcium in your bones. It can cause you to gain more weight, as we'll talk about later, and a lot of other things that are deleterious to the body. So we have to get it back to a physiological normal. Well, the, the, what, the, what the body is able to evolve and do is that an excess of cortisol will actually come back up. And when there's an excess, it will bind to the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. And you guys can see here this negative sign. That means that when this cortisol binds to the pituitary, it will actually inhibit the pituitary from secreting more ACTH. It also inhibit the hypothalamus from secreting more CRH. So after a while, right, when this cortisol is being used up, because there's no more CRH being produced or there's no more ACTH being produced, then there will be no more cortisol being produced. So if it has a very high level in your blood, because of negative, in, uh, negative feedback inhibition, it will cause it to go back down, right? And the perfect thing about this is that it's self-regulating because once the levels go down, it won't just go down to zero. What will happen is when these levels get low enough, it'll actually unbind from the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. And it'll go to the other tissues, which will then allow the hypothalamus and the pituitary to secrete more CRH and more ACTH, which will allow some cortisol to be released again. So it's a constantly fluctuating um, levels of cortisol. And that's what helps main, and that's why uh, it's important to know, to know that homeostasis is dynamic. It's always changing up and down, but it's always that that maintains a stable baseline overall as an average. And as you guys will go into your higher level science classes, you'll realize that a lot of these mechanisms are, are regulated by negative feedback, especially about chemistry. However, the uh, two main ones is actually in labor and lactation because it is regulated by positive feedback. So when you're in labor, um, usually uh, if it was regulated by negative feedback, when you start having a child and the oxytocin and the other hormones are increasing, it'll, because they're so high, they'll, they would decrease, but then you wouldn't be able to give birth to a child. So what happened is this positive feedback, saying more oxytocin will trigger even more of those hormones to be released. So it's an increasing, increasing more, increasing, in increasing amounts of hormones, which allow you to deliver the baby. And then once the baby is delivered fully, then the negative feedback kicks back in to bring it down to baseline. And lactation as well, with more uh, nipple stimulation, that will allow more, um, of pro more prolactin to be released. But it's, again, it's upregulating. So the more milk that is used up will allow more milk to be produced over time so that um, the baby is able to always have a constant food supply as long as it needs it for. Because once it stops, uh, once the need to lie for lactation stops, then the, then, the, then the mom will slowly lose that ability over time. 
So this is a slide about some of the nuances in sex hormone regulation. Um, and this is going to be mainly talking about female hormone regulation or more known as the menstrual cycle. But just a quick aside about males, just to get out of the way quickly. Um, males exhibit typical negative feedback loops in gonadotropin hormone, which means uh, the same negative feedback loops in luteinizing hormone and fo uh, follicle stimulating hormone, which cycleizes about every 90 minutes. Pretty cool. However, uh, for women, um, their menstrual cycle is a lot more complicated is based on this graph. So I'm just going to be going real quick over uh, some of the hormones and the trends in the menstrual cycle. Um, for more details, it can be found in the book. Um, but yeah, this is what you guys should know, be able to know for the test and be able to reason your way through this graph. So at first, uh, we have pretty low hormone levels for all these hormones, about for FSH, estrogen, LH, and progesterone. However, early on in the cycle, we have a slight increase in follicle stimulating hormone, which will then cause estrogen and progesterone to increase over time. And this uh, increase will cause a, a positive feedback loop in luteinizing hormone, which is why it peaks so fast and so high, which is what causes ovulation. However, because of this uh, rapid increase in estrogen and in, in the increase in progesterone, it actually acts on, it actually does, performs negative feedback on follicle stimulating hormones. So as you can see, it goes up to trick everything, but then it goes back down. And this ensures that only one egg actually matures. And you see it goes back up a little bit here and then because of the LH and it comes back down. And now as you can see at the end of this cycle, we can see that progesterone and uh, estrogen, they were, they were low and came high at around the ovulation stage. Progesterone came high a little later. And now at the end, you can see that they're still relatively high. So now negative feedback can be performed on these, which will then allow it to go back down to a very low baseline back to the beginning of the next cycle. But because of the positive feedback of luteinizing hormone and the negative feedback of follicle stimulating hormone, this makes sure that ovulation occurs, but only with the maturation of one egg. So interesting there. So on the exam, what I may ask you is, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize the specific uh, pathway, right? Or the specific, how, when it goes up or down the follicular phase or luteal phase. What I may ask you is a more understanding question of, okay, what kind of regulation of which of these hormones uh, causes one ovulation and two, the, the maturation of only one egg? Or I can ask you a pathophysiological question on the main exam, wherein um, if the FSH isn't inhibited by these estrogen or progesterone, what would be the result? Or I can ask you an even more difficult question is, if this patient has doesn't have positive feedback of positive feedback, positive feedback regulation of their LH, what would result? So now we're going to be talking about hunger, which um, unlike the the unlike the other hormones we talked about in the past, secreted from pituitary, uh, the brain doesn't really control the secretion of these, but they still affect the brain. And the two hormones that are going to, that we're going to be talking about is called ghrelin and leptin. <clears throat> so ghrelin is going to be released by walls of the GI tract when they're empty and it'll signal for hunger, right? So when the walls of the GI tract are not full, that means that there's no more food to process and digest. So it'll tell the hypothalamus, hey, we need to eat more food and thus it'll cause you to be hungry. Leptin is the other side of the coin to this. It's uh, a, sort of some, a sort of antagonist to ghrelin in the hypothalamus where um, leptin tells you when you are full, when to stop eating, it tells you about satiety, satiety, satiety. And leptin is released when our, these fat cells, these adipocytes are full and can't hold any more, um, and can't hold any more uh, lipids for energy storage. So the important thing to know about here is two, the, the specific hormones, when they're released, and also um, they're functioning in the hypothalamus, right? Uh, one uh, ghrelin is for hunger, leptin is to stop eating, and that the brain does not secrete them. So now we're gonna be talking about stress. So what is stress? Well, stress is caused from sympathetic innervation. As I mentioned previously, uh, at the beginning of the PowerPoint, 
um, the sympathetic chain is interesting because it has a chain of ganglia, right? So what this means is, is that the entire sympathetic, all these sympathetic ganglia are in one chain parallel to the spinal cord. So what this means is the activation of, um, of from the brain to the sympathetic chain can cause um, immediate changes in the whole, in the entire body because um, the sympathetic chain is connects the brain to the rest of the body for these specific, um, for specific functions. The reason why this is important is because when we activate our sympathetic chain or our sympathetic inner, uh, nervous system, we want to induce stress because it's a fight or flight response, right? So be, if this is a life-threatening situation, our body has to be able to react immediately. So we have all the ganglia in one area so that they're all activated. They can all activate their specific end organs at the same time. On the other hand, when you think about the parasympathetic nervous system, it's not as immediate. It doesn't have to happen immediately. So it has all of its ganglia close to the end organs and it's a loss and it's a little bit slower to activate the whole body. So some of the things that happens during this stress response, this sympathetic innervation, well, the muscles are going to be primed, ready for this flight or fight response through the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous and the autonomic nervous system will redirect nutrients and oxygen to the muscles. So the way this works is the uh, sympathetic nervous system will ca uh, cause vasoconstriction in the GI tract and the internal organs so that most of the blood and, and its nutrients can go to the muscles um, so that it can supply the, uh, this flight or fight response. Sympathetic innervation also triggers the release of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla, which is a positive chronotrope and vasodilator. So a positive chronotrope means that it will increase heart rate, right? So it'll allow more oxygen to the muscles. And vasodilation means it'll allow more blood to those, uh, to those muscles. So it'll allow for uh, contractions without having to worry about cramps and whatnot. And the parasympathetic nervous system more restricts blood flow to the organs that I just mentioned. And finally, these uh, neuroendocrine hormone release will affect metabolic functioning and trigger the release of glutocorticoids. So what does this mean, right? To, and to answer what this means, or understand what this last slide means, I have to go with talk about glucocorticoids. What are they and what do they do? Well, glucocorticoids help prepare the body for a potential threat. It triggers glycogenolysis, uh, which will break down the glycogen stored in our muscles um, it will allow for um, a lot of glucose, a high um, glucose concentration in our blood. This way, um, our, our muscles can get a, a very fast, readily available amount of energy for when we have a fight or flight response. These glucocorticoids can also bind to the brain for increased attention and learning. So this, so when you're stimulated or aroused, you're able to learn better, you're able to pick up more things than when you're tired or sleepy. And it inhibits certain functions like growth and immune response because those aren't as important in the moment. Um, and as a result, because stress affects our body in very acute ways to help us in acute situations, chronically, this can be very bad. So in this last slide, we talk about some of the, the issues <clears throat> with chronic stress, right? If we prepare our bodies for an acute response, but it happens for a prolonged amount of time, some of these temporary uh, sacrifices uh, can cause a lot of pathological states within our body. For exposure, uh, for example, um, overexposure to these glucocorticoids from as a result of this stress response can be muscle, at uh, muscle atrophy, increased fat storage, can I able to digest as well? Prolonged hyperglycemia because there's increased uh, glucose in our blood. Hypertension because uh, the um, epinephrine that is released from the adrenal medulla is going to be a positive chronotrope and also a positive inotrope, so heart, so stronger contraction to the heart. Atherosclerosis because there's more uh, uh, more lipids in the bloodstream and more glucose in the bloodstream. Increased risk of heart attacks because the heart is beating a lot harder. And there's a lot more lipids and whatnot in the heart in the blood. Increased resistance to inflammation and infection because the immune system is going to be suppressed 
so that more resources, more resources can go to the muscles. But over time, like we said, this can affect, uh, severely in fact, affect the immune system. It could also inhibit neuron growth in the hippocampus because during the stress response, it isn't as important um, to learn and memorize things when you're in a stressful environment. But also, uh, the chronic stress can also cause uh, suppression of decision making and cognitive pathways um, for so many reasons. It can expedite the normal aging process of the brain and can finally cause sleep disorders because you aren't able to sleep as well. There's a lot of issues with the um, hormones of sleep because our stress hormone is uh, combating our normal sleep cycles. Because if we're asleep, you have to be calm and at ease. But in a fight or flight response or in chronic stress, you're just trying to do the exact opposite. So it can cause an imbalance on your body and can cause a lot of issues such as sleep disorders. So I want to thank you guys for watching this presentation and learning as much as you can. This is the end of presentation. A lot of these sources are from your Brain Facts book. So if you uh, didn't hear anything, if you didn't understand something properly, either send us an email or you can read from the Brain Facts book. So. Um, if you guys have any questions, please let us know and thank you.